Hello and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. March 21st, 2024, the When is Government Speech Coercion edition. I'm David Plotz of CityCast. I'm in Washington, D.C., still in my new home. That was pretty good last week, so I, I stayed here. I stayed. Uh, the mild chuckle was from John Dickerson of CBS Primetime in New York City. Hello, John. Hi. No, I was laughing because we've been talking about the um, judicial fortunes of SB4, which seemed to go up and down with the rising and setting of the sun. So so what if like your living condition was the same as SB4? You would be in a new location every time we report it. Whoa. John's previewing the show already. Uh, not previewing the show, just looking bemused, is Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School from Vermont today. Always in New, uh, in New England, not in New Haven, though. Yeah, I found a reporting trip to do in Vermont. Glad to be here. Hey, John. Hey, David. This week on the Gap Fest, March Madness, Supreme Court style. The Supremes consider whether government speech is coercion or when it might be coercion and when it might be just persuasion. And they also weigh in on SB4, Texas's new immigration law. And we'll talk about the ups and downs, the twists and turns, the convolutions, the Mobius strip that is the state of SB4. Then former President Trump is having a hard time raising the hundreds of millions of dollars he needs for a bond to appeal one of the judgments against him. Is he the victim of an inflexible legal system? Or is he the bond villain? Whoa. You see how you see what nice I did work. there? We Then uh, new studies reveal what we all already kind of knew, which is that students lost ground during COVID and they have not regained it. What can we learn from the new data that's out? Plus, we'll have cocktail chatter. And a reminder that we're going to be live with you next week, or those of you who can come join us in Washington. We'll be at the Hamilton here in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday, March 27th at 7.30. Uh, there's still some tickets left. Please come join us. It's going to be a really fun show. John was sending around texts before today just saying, we're going to make this so fun. And we believe him. Yes, exactly. It was it was like a, a an asynchronous locker room chat. You are manifesting. You're going to yes, manifest. Yes, exactly. I was. Really I had some sage and so forth. So we're going to go to, uh, you're going to go to slate.com slash GabFest live to get tickets. Join us on Wednesday, March 27th at 730 here in DC at the Hamilton. Slate.com slash GabFest live for tickets. Hey there, GapFest listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. And if you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. So whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. The Supreme Court, usually so languid, so unbusy, was very busy this week. They heard argument in a pair of cases about whether or when the government can speak and when it shouldn't speak, and then issued a temporary order allowing Texas to enforce its new harsh immigration law, an order that was superseded and then maybe superseded again and then superseded and then had been preceded. And it's just so complicated. But let's start, Emily, with the speech cases. So can you quickly orient us to the two government free speech cases, one of which involved federal efforts to encourage social media platforms to crack down on COVID misinformation largely, and the other involving efforts by New York state officials to condemn the NRA uh, or condemn certain things the NRA was doing as part of its business. What are the main issues in these cases? These are completely separate cases factually, but they both have this question about where the line is between the government voicing an opinion and trying to persuade someone to do something versus coercing them. The first case, um, the lawsuit is brought by a couple of uh, state attorneys general in Missouri and Louisiana, and they have this incredibly sweeping claim that the government, in trying to tell the social media companies about misinformation related to COVID, related to the 2020 election, 
that the government crossed the line into coercion. And there are all these emails and other communications that have been released as part of this lawsuit. And the question is whether the government's um, expressed views about the dangers of disinformation, you know, even if strongly expressed, amount to coercion in a situation where the government was not threatening some direct action. So it wasn't like, oh, Facebook, if you don't take this post down, we're going to file an antitrust suit against you. It was just like, we are concerned about these posts. Why aren't you doing anything? Um, To me, they're kind of incredible lawsuits. Uh, And distressingly, the district court judge who you know, built the record, who is a Trump appointee, really seemed to have edited and the meaning of edited emails from government officials in a way that changes their meaning and makes them seem much more nefarious than they really were. And so the court was struggling with a record that seems like it is in itself riddled with misinformation. Um, and that part of the case, I, you know, I it, look, it didn't seem like there was a majority on the Supreme Court for ruling in favor of these states and their theory. But the fact that the underlying record is messed up is just like a troubling sign. Did the justices accept that the, tr- the underlying record was messed up when they were told it in briefs, presumably, and that they might correct the underlying record in whatever decision they issue? I mean, not really. At oral argument, it came up mostly in questions with Justice Alito, and he seemed to sort of be dismissive of the problems that the Biden administration was raising about the record. And that was also distressing. And also, and Emily, tell me if this is um, too harsh, but he also seemed to be clueless when he asked or when he said, you know, what the administration was doing is they were they were calling and pressuring and having meetings about talking to social media. I mean, would they do that with the New York Times and the Associated Press? And the thought, answer is, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, indeed, they would. With this, so so people like me uh, have gotten into professions to ask dumb questions because it turns out dumb questions is all they have. I understand why I do it, but as a judge, like, aren't they supposed to? Is there a probative value to asking a dumb question, or was it just a dumb question? It's always the value to ask a dumb question. No, no, it was a way of of Alito's mindset. Well, no, no, sorry. But the way he asked it, it was loaded. Sorry, it was a loaded, it was a dumb loaded question. In other words, it was a question asked where the clear answer he thought was, no, they would never do that to the New York Times. It led to a really interesting set of exchanges because uh, both Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett kind of chimed in to say, wait a second, actually, like, you know, and in Kavanaugh's case, he was talking about having worked for the federal government. And he was like, yeah, we did. Like, people do make these phone calls all the time. And there was even like a little joking about the public information office at the Supreme Court. I think what was revealing, you know, sometimes with Alito, you just feel like his brain is marinating in the right wing media ecosystem. And uh, so maybe it was elucidating for him to hear that this is not actually how like the distinction he was making. He he said that the government was only talking this way to social media companies because the companies were subordinate. And that just seems like such an odd characterization of these incredibly powerful international um, juggernauts. I'm not going to argue argue the upside down monkey here. I don't, I'm not like going to make a ridiculous claim, but I do worry that in a different kind of administration, a government that is constantly talking to social media platforms, a government that has a history as say Donald Trump did of, of, you know, trying to retaliate against organizations he perceived as a, as its enemy, it might well be extremely dangerous. And if the lines are blurry, there. Maybe we do want to err on the side of not allowing the government to talk to these organizations at all. I mean, I'm not sure I believe that. But if if one of the possible paths we could go down is they do talk, they are allowed to talk to social media platforms or other organizations, but they also have the the veiled threat behind them. Isn't right. Isn't the threat always that's veiled because they're the federal government? Yeah. This is the fundamental dilemma of disinformation and free speech in our era, right? We see all this disinformation blasting from these channels that have some editorial judgment going on, but also just obviously like tons of content from users. It's causing a lot of harm. We're uncomfortable with the government stepping in to regulate it because of the scenario you just posed, David, of like, 
you know, nefarious censorship. Right. It was a perfect phone call. Right. We also don't know what to do about the social media companies self-regulating because they are incredibly powerful and can be manipulated. And also, they don't seem to be doing a very good job. Note that because of this case, just as like collateral damage just from its being filed, the companies are not doing all of the labeling and like less amplifying of false speech that they had been doing. And so we're really like between a rock and a hard place. Um, And your concerns about this are well taken. I don't know what the court is going to come up with as a kind of clear line between persuasion and coercion. If I call from the White House, there's an implicit threat, no matter how congenial the phone call is. So has there been any other case in which a line has been drawn that can be looked to as a possible model? I mean, there's this old case about a bookseller and the government ordering it to take obscene materials off the shelves, and that was clearly going too far. It's from a different kind of universe. Like, it's not, right? I mean, that's not really what's happening. I guess one thing I've been thinking about back to the, like, mainstream media examples, you know, there are lots of times, particularly in national security situations where the government strongly urges the media not to publish something, right? They're like, look, if you say that people's lives will be a danger or, you know, America's interests will be harmed in some way. And the editors always hear them out and they decide what to do or not do. And nobody ever suggests that, like, the White House can't make those calls. Well, except except throw yourself back to 1970 when the Nixon administration is doing this and is then going to challenge the 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 broadcast license of the Washington Post company when broadcast license comes up for renewal. Right. And then you have to have, you know, Catherine Graham, like stare, the publisher then of the Washington Post, staring them down and they went ahead and it's seen as this brave moment. And I think we have depended since then on norms more than law to restrain the government in that kind of situation. And of course, and on a Supreme Court and on a Supreme Court that stands on that side, too. Yeah. I just don't see how you could have a rule where the government can't talk to the social media platforms about their content moderation. That just doesn't make sense. Although I do agree that if you start having some kind of like threat on the end end of the line, like an actual threat, that that would go too far. But yeah, actual threat would go too far. The question is, is it always implicit? But also, in addition to having more examples now of how a White House can Pressure put pressure on. We have more national security in, uh, instances in which foreign companies use, sorry, foreign countries malevolently use social media to affect. So it's not just in the state of the pandemic. There could be a compelling national security interest to talk to national secur- to talk to these social media platforms. Could you make the standard compelling national interest, and then you just debate about whether the nature of the conversation was with respect to a compelling national interest? I mean, I guess you could try that. I feel like that would be pretty hard for the lower courts. Like, is COVID misinformation compelling national interest? At certain points during the pandemic, maybe it was. Like, I don't know. That seems hard to me. Well, lots of people dying. Seems like you don't want that in a nation. Well, sure. But then it's like, okay, well, then every time there's a health threat, does that count? It just, that's very subjective is all. Well, I mean, isn't anything going to be subjective? Well, anything that depends on like carving out a particular subject matter. And yes, anything is going to be somewhat subjective, but I don't like making it about a particular range of topics. You would say any, you would say government couldn't do this unless there was a compelling national interest, which could be a physical danger. Well, it would always be probably a physical danger. And then like, that's not about just COVID. It's about anything where lots of people would be harmed by this information coming out. That seems squishy to me. Yeah. I don't know what they're going to say. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the NRA case, I think, which was the New York case that um, was the second case the court heard argument, that one, the justices did seem to think that the New York state government had crossed the line. And that was a case where in the wake of the Parkland shootings, um, a finance official for New York was saying to private companies, we advise you not to do business anymore with the NRA. You know, and so the ACLU was representing the NRA and was saying this was way out of line. It is the government being coercive. Um, And then the lawyer for the state of New York was arguing, well, no, like the problem that the New York official was concerned about here was like fraud by the NRA and illegal conduct. And so she was allowed to be warning companies. But that one seemed more on the side of coercion because should the government be advising private companies who to do business with? Like somehow that seemed fishier. Well, it's 
I guess there's a distinction between advising, sort of generally stating that what NRA is doing is a fraud and then specifically speaking to individual companies and telling them do not do business. Right. And I don't know. And I didn't actually read the details enough to know which line they were on. Yeah. I mean, that was the question in the case. Before we move on to, to the Texas case and the Supreme Court's role in it, I just want to note how pleasant in a kind of early 80s way it is to see the ACLU defending the NRA. That's like a real, it's like, oh, that feel makes me feel good. Like, go look at those civil libertarians out working for people they surely disagree with on things. So that was, I liked, I enjoyed that. Um, so, John, it is, as you were noting before we started talking, it's practically impossible to follow the back and forth on the new Texas law. But but what roughly is going on with this new Texas law, which would allow Texas effectively to have its own immigration policy uh, independent of the federal government? Texas passed SB4, which would allow, as you say, Texas law enforcement officials to, to arrest and jail and return to Mexico, even if they didn't come from Mexico, people that are suspected of being illegally, having crossed the border illegally. This was passed in December. The Justice Department, Justice Department filed a suit, I guess, in January. Um, and then from then until yesterday, it has been paused by the courts at various different levels. Uh, Emily can cite the various levels, which I think is not unimportant here. Anyway, it made it all the way to the Supreme Court where Samuel Alito and Emily can explain to me why it was Alito. I guess he was in, was it in He's his role as the justice assigned circuit, to that assigned circuit? Assigned to that circuit. Mm -hmm. So each justice is assigned to a particular circuit, right? Is that why John Roberts ruled on the Navarro case too? Yes. Okay. So in his role as the justice assigned to that particular circuit, he kept pausing as before, in other words, allowing it not to go into effect. And then on Tuesday night, he said, nope, pause is off. It can go. And and SB4 was alive for eight hours. At that point, it wasn't just him. It was all of them. They all. Oh, moved. right. They actually and they they all weighed in. Right. Yeah. And the three okay. liberal justices dissented from letting it go into effect. Which Emily can explain. So then it was alive for eight hours, and then it was uh, the Fifth Circuit paused it. Yes. Uh, and uh, now it's on pause again. Um, the main argument, uh, or one of the main arguments, is whether the state of Texas is overstepping its bounds on an issue that has um, always been uh, a fit that considered a federal issue, and that is a federal issue, among other reasons, because immigration intersects with international treaties and with obligations um, uh, to other countries like, say, Mexico, but not limited to Mexico, obviously, lots of other countries as well. Substantively, this law is kind of bananas in terms of precedent and like the way immigration and That's sovereignty. A technical term. It is. Those of you who didn't go to law school. It's my favorite technical term of late. It feels like it's coming up a lot in the context of the Supreme Court. It's bananas because we've just always had an understanding and the courts have reinforced this over and over again, that it is the federal government that makes policy regarding sovereignty and the borders. And the reason for that is the supremacy clause in the Constitution, um, the federal government supreme over the states in these lots of matters, especially international ones. And also, this is chaos. Like, in the nanosecond when Texas was about to enforce this law, and who knows, maybe they'll get to try again, the question of how this was actually going to work was completely unclear. So Texas is going to make arrests of people who cross into Texas. And then what? Because Texas doesn't have the authority to deport anyone. So they were going to hand them over to federal immigration agents who were saying like, no, we're not going to do this. Like Texas doesn't get to order the federal immigration authorities to comply with its law. In the wake of this, you know, brief window um, of the sun shining on the law. Other states are now talking about similar legislation. And from the point of view of, you know, politics, you can totally see why. I mean, Texas Governor Greg Abbott has been getting lots of exciting press about this. He seems like he's standing up to the Biden administration. You know, immigration seems out of control on the border, and he is taking this concrete step to address it, et cetera. It's just not it's really hard to imagine how we can have separate state policies about a national and international matter like immigration. And you also have sheriffs in towns in Texas saying, we, we don't have jail space for any of this to happen. Like we can accommodate 20 more prisoners. And obviously the flow of migrants is considerably uh, larger than that. 
I assume that the Supreme Court, when it eventually deals with this, will probably not allow this law to go into effect, in part because of what you said, Emily, about how there are now states, left, right, center, Iowa has passed a law on this um, that are passing their own immigration laws. And they, there cannot be a patchwork of immigration laws in this country. That's just not it doesn't work. So I assume the Supreme Court will will not allow this to happen. But it is I mean, as a political matter, I think. God love Greg Abbott. He is doing he is doing the Lord's work for the Republican Party because it is a good look for the Republicans to have things like this happening. And it's a good look for them to have judges and the Biden administration stopping them from doing this because it is it's this is politically, I'm sure, extremely popular. Probably they don't care that much whether whether it goes into effect. And I think also this points to the dysfunction of Congress in Washington in a way that is also very useful for Republicans. Do you want to hear more from us after this episode? Yes. The answer is yes. Stick around for our Slate Plus bonus segment. Today, we're going to be talking about the mystery of Kate Middleton and its impact on the U.S. presidential election. Yes, we're going to talk about its impact on the U.S. presidential election. I have a theory. This segment, however, just for Slate Plus members, if you are a Slate Plus member, thank you. You have been able to keep the show chugging along all these many years. I had this interesting experience this week where my Slate Plus membership suddenly seemed to stop working and I, I contacted people. And they fixed it, but it was a, I was in a moment of panic because I was trying to read something on Slate that I really wanted to read, and I couldn't because my Slate Plus membership had had stopped working. So, but it was fixed, and I just it just how valuable it is to me. Um, you get bonus segments as a Slate Plus member on the Gabfest every episode, and you get discounts to live shows like our show next week. And you don't hit the paywall on the Slate site. So, if you're a member, thank you. If you're not a member, go to slate.com/gabfest plus to become a member today. That's Slate.com slash GabFest Plus. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, as our company expands, so do our hiring efforts. How can AI help us attract top talent? Signed, Searching for Higher Power. So, Searching for Higher Power, one of the most daunting undertakings of an HR leader today is building a new team and finding and vetting new talent. This is a very time-consuming process and can take precious organizational resources. As a companion to the HR team, AI technology can be used to create job descriptions, analyze candidate resumes, and filter candidates into various pools based on experience, skills, or any other parameter. You can also use AI to match internal talent with positions available. Parameters for this can be set, rules can be set, that can all be done through the algorithm. There are so many things that we as humans could be not looking at that AI can do in a matter of seconds. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. You're listening to this podcast, so you care about history and what a period we're living through right now, specifically when it comes to the situation in Israel and Gaza. Right now, you're hearing a lot of loud voices screaming about genocide, massacre, and occupation. But these words, slogans, and various headlines are not enough to help understand what is happening over there. And that's where this podcast comes in. Check out Unpacking Israeli History. Catch up on previous seasons and enjoy new episodes from season six each week where they cover many of the topics that are relevant to what's going on in Israel today. From the history of infamous terror groups Hamas and Hezbollah to the story of Nakba to Israel's disengagement from Gaza in 2005, there's so much to uncover. Unpacking Israeli history cuts through the noise and helps you understand Israel's present through understanding Israel's history. So educate yourself. Learn the history behind the headlines. Find Unpacking Israeli History wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay. Donald Trump, as we discussed, recently lost a civil case in New York, a finding by Judge Engeron that his company had committed a fraud against banks and insurers by lying about valuations of its real estate. That case, which was brought by Attorney General, State Attorney General Letitia James, resulted in an enormous four hundred plus million dollar judgment against the Trump Organization and some behavioral penalties for Trump and his kids as well. 
In order to appeal that ruling, Trump needs to post a bond of nearly half a billion dollars, perhaps the largest such bond ever required in a case like this. James didn't have to give him any time, but she ended up giving him 30 days to get the bond uh, backed by a banker and insurer. But it looks like those 30 days, which I think expire on Monday, looks like he's not going to be able to do it. He's not going to be able to pull it together. The major insurers have said they will not accept his real estate as collateral for a bond, and he doesn't have enough cash or liquid investments to cover the bond otherwise. But it's a kind of interesting uh, legal issue because if he doesn't come up with a bond or get it lowered, the attorney general can start seizing his assets. Um, and he could declare bankruptcy to kind of get out of this. He can still appeal. He can still try to sort of get them to to lower the, the bond amount. But it's it, I actually found myself almost sympathetic to Trump in this case. And maybe you guys are going to talk to me about, tell me why I shouldn't be. But um, Emily, was this, was, was, uh, where, where do we stand on this? One of the issues here is that much of Trump's wealth is in the form of real estate. So it's not cash and it's not liquid. And the um, firms that normally underwrite bonds like this won't accept real estate as the collateral. And so in that sense, like Trump's uh, forms of wealth are a poor match for this particular situation. So it's such poetic justice that a man who lied about the value of his real estate is now finding that banks and insurers will not accept his valuation of his real estate as collateral. Like it's, it is, he's literally being hoisted on his own petard. The banks, are, the banks and insurers are like, you know what? We can't really value this in such a way that we can, we can assign it a value for the purpose of this bond. And one reason we can't really value it is because people like you lie to us all the time about how much your real estate is worth. Well, that's maybe a reason not to be so sympathetic, right? Because of exactly the dynamic you described. The other question I have about this, and this may be my own ignorance, so I'm curious what you guys think. Why isn't it just fine that he has to sell some stuff in order to pay this, right? He's still worth over $2 billion, according to like Forbes or whoever is estimating this recently. I understand he would he would lose his shirt on those sales. They'd be fire sale prices because people would know that he was being forced to sell. Why is that supposed to be like, why is sparing him that loss, the, the driving motivation here that should make us feel like this is deeply unfair? Well, there's mixed things. He doesn't want to do it because it, it goes at the heart of his brand. Um, so that's the choice he's making. Uh, which doesn't go, get into fairness. It's just he doesn't want to sell that stuff at fire sale prices or declare bankruptcy, another option he could take, um, because his entire myth is built on that idea. But I do think I'll take the fairness. Well, point. it's up to him. Well, but yes, it's up to him. But when you say tell someone, I mean, imagine this was your house, like that you had to sell your house uh, at a fire sale in order for you to appeal a civil judgment against you that you believe to be deeply unfair. Like, is that, would you think that that was okay for you to have to sell your house? I mean, th there was a civil judgment in a, in a court against you. So you, you do owe that money at the moment, but you, but you also have this right to appeal and to make the conditions right. well, for that's appeal the so onerous yeah. that you literally okay. have to give up something which is, you know, precious to you and you have to, you know, and it's both embarrassing and hugely costly just to appeal seems to me to be. Well, that's a different thing, right? And that's unfair. leaving him the only option, but I mean, what other, um, how would you structure it in a way that said you have to come up with this money unless coming up with the money, you have to do it by any of these methods? I guess you could protect real estate the way they do in Florida. Well, what Trump's lawyers are asking for is to reduce the amount of the bond to $100 yeah. million. Dollars, and they're also pointing out that because his wealth is in real estate holdings, it's not going anywhere. So if the state of New York ultimately wins the appeal, they'll still be able to have everything, right. which I think is an interesting argument. I mean, Ruth Marcus, friend of the Gap Fest, wrote a good column about this for the Washington Post, basically taking David's um, side and in terms of fairness. And so Ruth's argument was that it is an example of Trump derangement syndrome, by which she means like everyone reacting to Trump in a way that's distorting of behavior. She thinks that that the the Trump derangement system in syndrome in this instance is to require this gigantic bond payment, which this person can't pay. And and then you go back to David's argument, like, would you want to have to sell your house to be able to appeal? I can't decide whether I think she's right or whether changing the rules and lowering the amount is the example of like 
the system just contorting itself for Trump. What's the interest in making sure he pays even just to appeal? Well, because if you didn't have these bonds, then you could have a litigant that's on the hook for however much money who then like sells off all his property or just like un- offloads his wealth onto his kids as a way of becoming what's called judgment proof where you don't have to satisfy the judgment. But couldn't you just say you can't do any of those things? I mean, the same way they say, like, freeze your emails and don't give them away when you're caught up in litigation. You would say you can't make any sales pending appeal. Well, yeah, you, they base they more or less. That's one of the arguments that Trump lawyers is making is that he effectively cannot sell his property anyway. Right. And well, effectively or not, you could say you don't have to pay it, but you can't do anything to touch it in this period. I mean, right. you make it and- a rule, not just an agreement. Yeah, and they do have a special master who's overseeing the Trump organization anyway, so they have someone in there. I mean, yeah, that is a workaround. And then the question again becomes, like, is the workaround the fair way that the system is providing due process, or is the workaround accommodating someone who is refusing to take a hit that lots of other people take? Yeah, but I don't think there are lots of other people who take it, in part because there just aren't a lot of people like Trump, and there aren't a lot of people who are as nefariously criminal and misleading as Trump. and most of the time, sort of public organizations, like there aren't that many privately held organizations that have ended up in trouble like this, which is why the scale of the fine is so out of whack with with historic precedents on it. It's just like he's he is kind of a case of one. It's not it's a case. And he's sort of a case of one because he's wickedly Trump, but it's also because his real estate empire is like different than most other companies that end up in situations like this. He's only a case of one in terms of scale. I mean, lots of individuals and companies have to post big bonds that require them to take a haircut. Yes. Well, I wonder what, what do either of you want to hazard where how you think this is going to end? I I kind of think they're going to end up in a situation where he I, I do not think they're going to seize the Trump Tower. And I don't think he's going to go into bankruptcy. I think they're going to end up in a situation where he is allowed to post a lower bond with some constraints on what he can do with his real estate. I don't know, because we're talking about the New York courts, right? I mean, ultimately, the highest court in New York, which confusingly is called the New York Appeals Court instead of the New York Supreme Court, is going to weigh in on this. And it's going to be up to them. And they're like the opposite of beholden to Donald Trump. And I don't know how they'll see their interest in enforcing rules of state law here. Um, so it's it's a really interesting question. It's those New York values coming back to bite him. Hmm. Before we go, Trump also did have a busy week slandering Jews and Democrats and migrants and valorizing January 6th insurrectionists. Um, Said migrants, some migrants are not even human. That's great. Love it. Great, great job, Trump. Uh, John, you have thoughts? Well, I guess my only thought is that this it, it offered another exa- example of slight Trump derangement syndrome. He also mentioned that there would be a bloodbath if uh, he were not in office um, in the car industry because of Trump uh, Biden's policies. And there was a lot of concern about the use of the word bloodbath, suggesting that implicit in that was the idea that there would be violence if he weren't elected. It's not crazy to draw that conclusion because he has, in fact, suggested more um, explicitly that there will be violence if he's not elected. And and implicitly, when he says things like already that the 2024 election will be stolen, he is stoking the feelings of anger. But I guess what I always am more concerned with in these instances is what he actually says that is unmistakable versus what needs literary interpretation. And what was unmistakable is, as you mentioned, the valorizing of the January 6th uh, convicted rioters, over a thousand have been convicted or pled. Um, and the reason I think this is so important is he's pledged to pardon them what uh, what he calls hostages uh, on the first day, his first day in office. And if you think of three component parts of a healthy democracy, one is the belief in free and fair elections. The second is the belief in the rule of law. And the third is the belief in verifiable facts. He has found a way to create a turducken of offenses against all three of those in this valorization of the January 6th rioters. So he is okay with trying to overturn the will of 81 million voters who voted for Biden. He's okay with bouncing people out of jail who've been convicted through the system um, and the way the system works. And then he's willing to do both of those things based on thorough misinformation about what happened in the last election. So it is in a neat package, the full package of the way Trump operates and the way he would operate in a second um, term. And there's no mistaking it. You don't have to you don't have to um, guess at what he means. He said it quite explicitly. 
We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with our third topic. This episode of the GapFest is sponsored by American History Tellers, the Underground Railroad. In the decades before the Civil War, slavery's grip on America tightened. But a diverse group of abolitionists, both black and white, constructed a clandestine path to freedom for the enslaved. Hosted by Lindsey Graham, not the Senator Lindsey Graham, Wondery's podcast, American History Tellers, takes you to the events, times, and people that shaped America and Americans, our values, our struggles, and our dreams. And in their latest series, American History Tellers explores the Underground Railroad, the covert network of secret routes and safe houses operated by men and women committed to helping enslaved people escape bondage in the South. Fugitive slaves and anyone helping them face terrible violence and even death if caught. But for those brave enough to risk the journey, the Underground Railroad offered a path to the northern states and Canada, where freedom was assured. Follow American History Tellers on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge this season, American History Tellers, the Underground Railroad, early and ad-free right now on Wondery+. Plus. This episode of the GapFest is sponsored by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia and identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. The long-term impact of COVID school closures was worse than most of us feared for America's school kids. According to National Association for Educational Progress data, it's data that is uh, it's, it's based on testing done of fourth and eighth graders, uh, data that's been analyzed by the New York Times and others, COVID school closures and remote learning just walloped school kids, setting them back more than half a year in math uh, in some cases. And it's learning loss that has mostly not been recovered. The more time kids were out of school, the more remote they were, the more they lost. Um, so, John, this was extremely unsurprising to anyone who has followed this issue, the series of stories about this. But it is so disheartening nonetheless. It, it is. And the other piece was that uh, experts say that the extended closures did little to help the spread of COVID, um, which there was one hole in this, which hopefully you'll explain to me, both of you. But let's before we get to that. Yeah. And, and I thought what was interesting to me about the findings was they weren't surprising. Um, but what was affirmed is that the worse off you are, the worse off you're going to be. So if you lived in a poor neighborhood, you were more likely to be out of school longer um, and therefore bore the brunt of greater learning loss. Except um, one of the interesting things about places that have pushed back and recovered some of the learning loss and learning loss in this instance doesn't mean you forgot how to do long division. It means the opportunity you missed to learn more during that period of time. So it's, um, but what interested me was the idea was, was where the communities have been able to improve in the period post COVID. Um, and that has largely poor communities have been devastated during that period, but not all poor com communities. And the curious thing is what, and there's some preliminary answers, but why in places like Mississippi and Nashville and Alabama, um, differing on math and reading, but um, why there's been success, what it is that's the the mix of success and can that be scaled um, to help other places? The strongest relationship to prosperity in any measure, economic measure, globally, nationally, locally, is human capital and education. And so it is, I think people get a little bit confused or they they diminish it when they say, oh, it's just half a year. It's just whatever. It's just, you know, a third of a year of learning loss. What's the big deal? When you have people who are worse educated, you get fewer 
engineers, you get fewer nurses, you get people who fewer people who complete a college degree, you get people who are less competent when they do complete a degree. They're less good at it because they've just there's a moment where they had a chance to to have their brain filled and expanded and 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 set a fire and it wasn't possible for them to take it. And so it will be a measurably poor uh, outcome for the country as a whole because of this. It's not just that these kids, you know, a few kids didn't learn long division or, you know, learned it worse. It's like there will be downstream impacts that we will all feel that will be bad. Yeah. Also, I care about all the individual kids and families affected. And, you know, when you go back to 2020 and 2021 and those incredibly urgent, difficult moments of decision making, I have sympathy for the government officials and the teachers unions that fought to keep the schools closed and had a lot of success, especially in, you know, blue cities. The longer out you go from the start of the pandemic, though, the more it was actually clear that the learning loss was going to be significant and that the benefits in terms of preventing the spread of COVID were less likely to really help. You know, in the fall of 2021, I know I felt that way about my own kid going to public school in New Haven and our system. And then certainly by the time you get to the vaccines and the, you know, little bit of early access that teachers got and school school personnel got to vaccines that winter, it started to be clear. And yet there was just this like deep set of fears, I think, especially in poor communities, because there was more COVID and more death in poor communities. And the whole thing is just kind of heartbreaking in retrospect. And I do feel like it is fair to ask questions about the messages that some local government officials and teachers unions were sending that were kind of stoking the fears as opposed to helping people get ready to go back to school. You know, one of the clear distinctions that I saw in my own community was that the private school kids were going back. Like those parents were looking at the data and deciding it was safe. And yes, they were at less risk and they had better circumstances to return to because the schools had more money at the time and were better equipped. But to have that disparity, it was really clear. Like I went to a party in the summer of 2021 when my kid had been out of school for many months as a public school kid. You know, it's not my usual position in the world to be like on the kind of disadvantaged side of a question like this. But I realized I was with all these people whose kids had been in private school and they'd had a totally different experience of the year. And also, if they had been in public school, they might have helped advocate for opening the schools, but they weren't there. And it was just such a stark reminder of these kinds of inequities and how they can just like boomerang onto people. To your point, Emily, it was the American Academy of Pediatrics in June of 2020 said that this was causing harm and schools needed to be reopened with safety measures in place. I mean, just in terms of setting a time for when this became more. Yes, I remember that. Juliet Kayyem came on the GabFest really early on and talked about how how shocking it was to discover there was actually no plan. You know, their plans for starting water treatment plants back up and making sure that, you know, that fire services are maintained, but no plan for schools. We didn't treat schools as essential institutions and we didn't te- treat teachers and other school personnel as essential workers. And we didn't celebrate their heroism for going back. We told them they couldn't go back safely or a lot of blue cities did say that. Can I ask about that, though? Because the teachers were the ones where whenever we would, I would report on this, it would be like, well, the kids aren't hurt. And, and representatives of the teachers would say, yeah, but it's the teachers who are in danger of catching COVID. And that's why we can't have school. Right. Except that when you look at the data showing that it didn't really prevent spread, then that starts to look really questionable. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't they weren't being malicious, but they were wrong in retrospect and they should own it. I think one of the things that I actually occurred to me is is how duped we were by remote learning that the the fact that the schools were able to pull together this idea oh everyone can go to school they're going to go to school on tablets we're going to make sure kids have tablets or computers everyone's going to get it and they're still going to go to school fooled us it, how it was anyone people. fooled by that well, this part as a parent i'm just no, like no i mean it was of course so yes crappy. it was so obviously terrible <laughs> and it was a mess but there was this delusion that kids are at school and your kid, your kid was there, you know, three hours a day and they were on a Zoom call. And we all knew, especially for younger kids, like this is disastrous. This is terrible. It's pointless. It's, it's so destructive. But it was this, it was this trick 
that people allowed themselves to kid themselves that their kid was at school. And one of the things that struck me in reading about this was Thomas Cain, who co-authored the one of the pieces of research here, which didn't re- rely on NAEP scores, but looked at the district level analysis. He cited this figure, which I don't know where it came from, but it's so precise, it goes to what you're saying, that um, that the, there was a view that um, you'd be able to basically recoup like 75 to 80 percent when he cites some of the problems you know, with what actually happened was this, I was this belief that somebody had that hybrid learning would have been 75 to 80% as effective. And they, that they were just totally wrong about that. And this, the specificity of that number made me think that there was some education professor out there who was saying, who was making a, a numbers-based claim that was wrong. It wasn't just thinking, oh, this will work. It was like, there was, there was analysis behind it that was wrong. It's also the case, and other people have pointed this out. I'm not I'm, not, I'm stealing this. Learning loss is only a piece of it, right? The tested learning loss. Like kids were also desocialized. Like communities broke down. Community programs stopped working. Networks that had been built up in the peaceful time of pre-pandemic time stopped functioning or collapsed. And a lot of stabilizing forces, and especially in the poor communities of the country, stopped working and or worked worse. And the price that we pay isn't just, of course, lower test scores, but it's also more crime, more mental health problems, chronic absenteeism, you know, more teachers leaving the system, worse public schools in places that are that are already had not good public schools. Big disaster. How do we avoid it? Well, let's turn to the sort of bright spots that John pointed to at the beginning of the segment. There has been a lot of federal money that has gone to the schools in hopes of recovery. It doesn't have a whole lot of strings attached to it. So we're having a giant natural experiment looking at how districts have spent the money. And there are some indications that in states that have lower levels of inequality to begin with, the recovery has been more even and better. Um, Kind of some surprising states like you know, not the usual suspects for great strides forward, I think in a good way. And then the other- Mississippi, Alabama. Exactly, Tennessee, I think. And then Mm -hmm. also some indication that I think that while there's like no quote magic bullet, that things like high intensity tutoring and more one-on-one attention and maybe additional school hours and days of instruction um, and like summer programs that are academic, but the kids can actually bear to sit through, that all those things are having some impact. And that is a hopeful sign. There is some like real recovery going on in parts of the country. I felt like the and I'm really, I don't know enough about Weekly County, Tennessee, but as you said- there's... I have been to Weekly County, Tennessee. I'll tell you anything you need to know. Oh, I good. a bunch because, of time there. Because, <laughs> oh my God, this is fantastic. So, uh, um, and then I'd like to learn about Vermont. Um, anyway, the the <laughs> like these pockets where, as Emily said, um, and this was true, I think in the, in the improvement in scores in, in Mississippi is that they've sh- it, intensive tutoring. The problem there is that you, you don't have enough tutors to do the work, but that they have found that intensive small batch tutoring and that in Weekly County, it's interesting because it's lower income and mostly rural. So it's not just, you know, the, the hardest hit places. What do you know about Weekly County and why is why are Weekly County's math and reading scores fully recovered? Uh, I couldn't tell you that. <laughs> I know it's in Northwest Tennessee. It's in Western Tennessee. It's on, uh, there's a lake where they filmed an Elizabeth Taylor movie, a very shallow lake uh, right near the Mississippi. Um, a lot of, I ate a lot of catfish. I be, I was friends with a guy named Roy Heron, who is a Democratic state legislator from Weekly County. And I visited him in 20, 2004, I think, um, and hung out with him in Weekly County and drove all around Weekly County in 2004. And I, the thing I remember is that Roy was a Democrat and I bet a district that is now, I bet is like as red as can be at this <laughs> point. But he ran and he was running for state rep and there were zero votes for his opponent. He got every, like, only every single person who voted voted for him. Nobody wrote in anybody else. That was the, that was the thing that surprised me. Um, but I don't know about the test scores. Adding to Emily's list, the school year you extend by offering to pay teachers more, just making sure the teachers out there who uh, are like, wait a minute, why am I going to work longer? But the, the idea would be to, to, to pay them more over the summer. And then this idea of the ninth grade as a fire break that you say basically – this is a disaster and we're not going to let it spread beyond ninth grade. And and if by ninth grade you find these pockets that haven't been able to recover on their own, then you focus intensive um, energy there, which then leads me to my question about this, which is think about all the crap we talk about in the presidential race. 
this is a huge problem, right? Poverty, inequality, the building of skills for the precise reasons David mentioned are should be huge national issues in the conversation, whether you have national policy or not is another matter. But in terms of turning our attention to the things that are most besetting our communities, this would be, you'd think, a thing to talk about. And especially after a massive pandemic with this kind of learning loss that's going to have the kind of generational problem. I mean, we should be talking about this all day long. And it's... um and we don't. So John, you know, one thing I often think about with this issue is that often in the world, liberals point to conservatives having these blind spots, legit, right? And say that they're not being like evidence-based in their thinking and approach. This is an issue where I think liberals have a lot of um, reckoning to do with their slash our own blind spots. One of the important moments in this is like right around that time when, as you mentioned, the American Academy of Pediatrics was talking about harm. Trump came out as president and said, we need to go back to school. And that was like a disaster because all of the a lot, not all, but many teachers unions and Democrats moved in the opposite direction. Like if Trump was saying something, it had to be wrong and they had to oppose it. And, you know, it's important to make one's mind up about evidence independent of who is advocating what position. And I think that got lost in that moment. Let's go to cocktail chatter when you're like having a drink to overcome your derangement syndrome, any kind of derangement syndrome that you have, Emily Bazelon, maybe you have Vermont derangement syndrome. What are you going to be chattering about? My friend, Rachel, who I'm staying with gave me a, novel to read that I've like gulped down in two big gulps. It's called Small Game. It's by Blair Braverman. And it's about a kind of survival TV show setup that goes awry. Um, You can tell that in the first pages. Uh, And it's just a good, short, you know, very consumable read. If you're looking for a book like that, I recommend it. Small Game by Blair Braverman. Uh. I already am writing it down on my book list. (laughs) John, what's your chatter? My chatter, and apologies for the banging going on next door, two years of banging. They seem to be installing like one shelf a day. First of all, let's cleanse the air with my lovely encounter with Sid um, on the Upper West Side, who is a listener to the GabFest. I just wanted to say hi to him. He was uh, very charming, and um, it's always lovely to hear from people who like the podcast. Um, And now to cleanse the air further and remind us that there are wonderful people in the world, Mackenzie Scott just did one of her annual donations. Basically, Mackenzie Scott takes in applications from nonprofits with annual budgets between one and five million. So they're not huge gargantuan nonprofits. A lot of them are smaller, don't have big names attached to them, and they apply for money. And she got 6,300 applications and gave away... uh, one or $2 million individually to 300 and some odd. So it's not just that she's giving away money. She has now given away $16.5 billion since divorcing Jeff Bezos, her former husband. But it's the way in which they do it that experts say is so so good. It allows lesser known organizations to gain access to the kind of money that might really help. Um, They provide unrestricted grants and then step back, which allows people to actually iterate and innovate and, you know, hopefully um, uh, do uh, good work. So I was happy to see that happening in the world. Yeah. God love her. I have very three quick tires. One that happened during this taping, which is the best thing that can happen to you. You know, that feeling if you put out something for your garbage or recycling, you're like, I sure hope they pick it up. I sure hope it gets picked during the, uh, so my new podcast facility taping area, I can see my garbage being picked up and they picked it all up. What was it? It was just, we had, because we just moved in. We had like probably 700 pounds of of cardboard. It was like all this cardboard that wasn't fully broken down. And it was like, oh, they took it all. Yay. Um, My other, okay. My other chatter really is I commend for a downer read Sarah Zong's story in the Atlantic DNA tests are uncovering the true prevalence of incest. It's an amazing story in the Atlantic about how, when people start taking DNA tests, there is a small fraction, still a pretty small fraction of people who discover you, you you can't discover it from your first 23 and me test, but if you get a weird 23 and me result and you decide to dig into it, you can then figure out, Oh my gosh, 
I'm adopted, but my parents were a brother and sister or a father and daughter. And it's now, it looks to be about one in 7,000 people. And almost all of them, it's a case of, you know, that sexual assault or child abuse is in, involved. And it's just awful. It's an awful, depressing story. Maybe that's information people are better off without to be paternalistic yeah, for it, a moment. For the most part, I think it, I think, I think so. I think so. Um, anyway, very interesting story. Finally, uh, I have a great job at CityCast open, a great job. And I could use you or someone you know. We're hiring a director of finance. Um, it's going to be the person who is going to help build CityCast as a business. Like finance people do modeling. They help set strategy. And a place like CityCast where we, we don't have a lot of business experience, we've got a great product, we've got a great team, but we need help on the finance side. And if you're somebody who is like hungry to work at a really awesome startup um, with a ton of energy and where you'll have you'll get a chance to grow in your finance career, please reach out to me or or tell some friend of yours who fits that profile. Um, just email me at davidplots at gmail.com or check out jobs.citycast.fm. Uh, or maybe it's citycast.fm slash jobs. So you can find it. Um, please, please, please. I could really use a great director of finance. Listeners, you have kept the chatters going. And we have a chatter this week from Joshua Re Weaver in Austin, Texas. Austin, where CityCast is soon to be launching. Joshua, what have you got to say? Hi, GabFest. My listener chatter features a Montana man with entrepreneurial dreams to create a freakishly large sheep. This story is straight out of Jurassic Park. There is a years-long international conspiracy, questionable biohacking, and a seedy underground market for exotic trophy hunting. The story also raises interesting questions like, why is it illegal to breed a giant sheep? And is it inherently immoral? Also, are the Bene Gesserit dabbling in sheep eugenics? You can find the full reporting from the AP. Thanks for listening, and until next time, have a beautiful day. You've got a chatter, please email it to us at gabfestinslate.com. That is our show for today. The Gabfest is produced by Shana Roth, who just like soldiered through clearly clear misery, clear cold misery to make the show. So thank you, Shana. Our researcher is Julie Hugan, who did not soldier through, but she does have awesome new glasses. Our theme music is by They Might Be Giants. Ben Richmond is Senior Director for Podcast Operations. Alicia Montgomery is the VP of Audio for Slate. Please join us on Wednesday here in Washington, D.C. at the Hamilton. Tickets at slate.com slash GapFest Live for our live show. It's going to be really fun. For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson and David Plotz, we look forward to seeing you and talking with you next week. Hello, Slate Plus. How are you? Um, we're going to just soldier on through this one. I don't really know what we're doing here. Kate Middleton, the Princess of Wales, Duchess of Cambridge, maybe. I don't even know. She uh, apparently had abdominal surgery um, in the winter. She vanished. She reappeared in a Mother's Day photo. The U Britain has a different Mother's Day. That's why it was a Mother's Day photo. That photo, it turned out, was photoshopped. She then did a social media post saying, apologizing for Photoshopping and saying she just liked to Photoshop things. They did not re-release -re an unphotoshopped photo. So we've never, we haven't seen a legit photo of her in, recently. And then she reappeared last week to do some shopping. There have been no real public explanations of why she vanished. And there's been a lot of extreme dismay with the royal family for countenancing this this lying in photos turns out that some other photos that that she uh had was in had been photoshopped as well several years ago so how is this going to impact the presidential election emily please tell me david no come on you gotta oh, i'll play you play you along play. you guys play i just like yeah it's the royals yeah, I, it wasn't even my idea. I, I am not blaming was you. I went along with it. I want to hear your theories. I don't oh. have one. John. Uh, well, I'll give it. I'll sally forward with a dumb idea, which you can then use to 
or leap with your better idea. Well, first of all, the reason, it, the way in which it affects the presidential campaign is that to the extent that everything is up for grabs and everybody does it and nothing is real. And, and for some people, there will be a kind of, I bet, and now I'm, I'm out on thinner ice here, but a kind of nobility in this fake, like, you know, it just basically and the royals can do no wrong. And therefore, if the royals have done something, it is perforce not wrong. Um, and verily, I say unto you, um, if you be not a knave. <laughs> anyway, um, so that sort of lowers the bar on misinformation. And since you have one candidate who is expert in and seeks innovation in misinformation, you can imagine um Donald Trump using this or hit or those who seek to support him in some way that's beneficial. Did I get close, David? That was just a snippet from our Slate Plus conversation. If you want to hear the whole conversation, go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus to become a member today. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.